Uh, thanks a lot, Chikati, uh, Maroon, uh, Beth. You guys put on a great show. These guys are awesome. I've run conferences enough, and I know how much of a pain in the butt it is. And you guys do a great job. And, and thanks a lot for Chikati themselves, just um, for all the stuff that you guys do, the research that you guys focus into. I think it's a great asset for companies coming into the state to be able to access some of these funds. And so, um, now for something completely different. Uh, we're gonna, you guys had some pretty cool talks on automation and, and mold designs. I'm gonna talk about what do I do with all your garbage. <laughs> um, as Maureen said, I, I have a halftime appointment. Um, I'm at Washington State University in the, in the Composite Materials and Engineering Center. And I'm also working with a company that's focused on uh, recycling. Um, primarily our focus right now is on fiberglass composites. <laughs> All right. Is the, uh, how about I just do it that way? <laughs> so if you, if you, carbon fiber gets a lot of the buzz. Everybody's talking about carbon fiber. But when you start looking at the numbers and the, the, the fiber demand and where we have been in our past, it's the glass fiber that's the big, the 800 pound gorilla in the room. If you look at the demand in 2017, there was 1.1 million metric tons of glass fiber that was consumed in composites and in insulation. Whereas carbon fiber is up there with 75,000 metric tons, but that's a 15 to one ratio. That's now. If you look back 20 years ago, when carbon fiber was still even more expensive than it is today, that ratio is even higher. And so one of the things that, you know, myself at, at WCU and, and then now my tenure at Global Fiberglass Solutions is really, you know, taking care of that 800 pound gorilla is how do we, how do we tackle all this glass fiber, especially a lot of the end of life glass fiber that's in our boats, in our aerospace industry, leisure craft, uh, transportation, and, and now you're seeing a lot with the wind energy. I'll get into a little bit here. All right, this is not gonna work, so. So if you look at what's out there right now, what are the options uh, that you have right now? And, and I kind of classified it out in, in your scrap that you deal with either pre-preg scrap or post-cured scrap. Um, with the pre-preg scrap, we have folks that are doing a chemical or a thermal breakdown of the resin, liberating the fiber, and, and then creating uh, secondary products, whether it be a reinforced pellet um, or or a, a veil or a, a weave, a non-woven product that you can um, then use later on in, in transportation sector. I've seen a lot of those go in there. So Shocker Composites, which I believe is, is the other, came from the other WSU, Wichita State, I believe. Uh, they, they're doing a chemical process there. Vartega also does a, um, a similar chemical uh, uh, savolysis process where they take the pre-preg, break it down, get rid of the resin, and they, they're, they're left with a a um, um, clean fiber at that point in time. So this is mainly looking at your pre-preg. So this is the stuff that doesn't uh, meet code anymore. It's, it's, it's in the freezer, been in there too long. It needs to be thrown out. Um, this is where these go. The other way of doing it is with the composite, our folks out at Port Angeles there, the Composite Recyc Recycling Technology Center, uh, mainly looking at how do you take these trims and scraps and how do you efficiently put them back into a similar carbon layup process. And they're doing some great work over there where they're looking at traditional forming techniques, but how do you get these materials and finding these little niche markets that aren't going to go back into an aerospace or space industry, but they could very easily go into a derailleur for a bike or, or a fly rod for fishing. Um, so when you start looking at post-cured, which is predominantly most of the material that's out there, especially your end of life, uh, the, the material that's post-industrial, that's been gone through some type of curing process. ELG is, is one of the bigger ones out there right now. I think they're based out of Britain or uh, somewhere in that area. Uh, they use a thermal process similar to a pyrolysis process where they break the resin down, liberate the fiber, and once again, they do a similar process as uh, Vartega and Shocker to make a, a non-woven avail um, and, and for secondary use. Chemical breakdown of, of Cured composites isn't really out there on the commercial sector. WCU is doing some stuff. Uh, there's a lot of, lot, of, lot of information in the literature, a lot of different universities that are working on that. 
Where we fit into this equation is in the mechanical breakdown of post-cured composites. And our focus is primarily on, on the wind turbine or on the, the glass fiber, which is predominantly the wind turbine market that we're looking at right now. Uh, GFSI, um, we are based in Bothell, Washington, so just a little north here. That's where corporate is right now. Uh, we started in 2009, but starting in 2009 was kind of relative. <laughs> When you have two people working for the company for about three or four years, it's kind of a, a small startup. We really didn't start moving until about 2015, 2016 going forward on this. Uh, the main focus of this, like I said, was looking at fiberglass recycling, um, seeing the need, you know, the boat industry has always been, you know, leisure craft. There's lots of boats out there and everybody goes, what can I do with this? Um, so that was where we started out a lot of our focus, but then more recently, as we started to build more and more turbines and more and more of these, these are out there everywhere, <laughs> we started looking at, wow, these are big things that are going into landfills right now. So we really started focusing quite a bit more um, on the wind turbine sector. So our initial manufacturing sites, our first one that's going in Sweetwater, Texas, and the main reason it's in Sweetwater, Texas, if you look at a map of where the wind turbines are, we're right in the middle of where predominantly most of the wind turbines are. Uh, we're also looking to put a site in Newton, Iowa, which is also right in the middle of wind turbine area. And then I'll get into this a little bit more as we go along, but we're not just focused on wind turbines. We, we can't just say that that's going to be our only feedstock. We know there's a lot of other glass fibers out there um, in different composites that we can access. Transportation industry, and guess what? The aerospace industry has been using glass fiber for decades. And so there's a lot of streams of material there. One of the things, how I got tied into this is the collaboration with WSU. GFS came to me in 2014 or so, looking at some pathways to, to, to work with this. And this is a really good example of how universities and, and industry can, can work together to make something happen. And so a lot of this started out with our designs at WSU. We developed a patent with WSU and GFS, um, and we're doing that right now, and that's part of the process that we're gonna be looking at. So why wind turbine blades? Well, there's over 56,000 turbines in the States. So each one of those has three blades. Right now, we're looking at 1.26 million tons of blades out there. Uh, it's based on each one of those blades that you see down there is on average about 15,000 pounds. And so they get, everybody you hear about this, it's, it's like making taller buildings. It's like making taller wind turbines that, that are going out in the ocean. They make them really big these numbers get even larger as we get forward. Uh, we're also looking at China, which of course dwarfs us by three times as much in China, and then Europe, which is about on pace with us. So those are other two options that we want to look at. Everybody goes, well, don't they last forever? Well, does a plane last forever? Does anything last forever? No. Generally, 15 to 20 years is about the life expectancy of a blade. A lot of the blades that we're taking down right now are actually what we cla classify as repower, where they look at it and say, well, you know, that blade I put up in 2005 is a big clunker. It's not very efficient. I can put a new blade on that's lighter weight, get 20% more efficiency on it, boom. It's an, easy, it's an easy call for management to say, I'm gonna take this thing down, put a new one up. So we're getting a lot of those kind of things too. So I kind of want to go back and, and, and talk about, I, I've done a lot of work in the recycling industry. I'm a hippie at heart. I want to I wanna see either that or an old grandmother, because old grandmothers never threw anything away either. So I'm trying to figure out if I'm a hippie or I'm an old grandmother. I'm going to go with the hippie. Um, but I wanna, I've, I've done a lot of work with companies that say, can you recycle this car? And I'm like, yeah, I can, I can turn anything into something for you. So whether or not you're going to turn it into money is, of course, the next question. But there's a lot, of, a lot of similarities between all these, and you're going to see this in, the, in the, you know, preaching to the choir with a lot of industry here. But you need to have a process. You got to have some reasonable way of taking somebody's garbage and turning it into something valuable. I mean, that, that's got to be there. Okay, that's the first thing. Feedstock logistics. You got this really cool waste stream that you want to turn into this really cool product. But if there's only 20 pounds of it a day out of this guy's operation, and you know, you gotta, how are you going to get all this material to your site to process it? And how are you going to do that efficiently and economically? Product performance, 
the days of saying that you're using a recycled material as your marketing strategy are over. It's got to it's got to compete. It's got to meet the demands of the product. So going into the the process, cost. I mean that's the number one thing. If it doesn't meet the cost of being able to process it, both in carbon credits or, or carbon um, energy footprint and in, in dollars. Um, the operation scale up must be manageable. Um, and my goodness, I've learned this. This is the first thing I learned going into industry is my goodness, you got to keep those investors happy. And they got to be able to take that, that, that business plan and look at that, that, that uh, process and go, oh, I understand that. I see where it's going. Because if you can't make that clear to your investors, you are out of it. Because we're all, start well, we are a startup <laughs> and getting investors and when you're bleeding money by buying equipment and not producing anything other, you've got to really rely on investors. And I see a lot of that same thing happening because the big companies aren't getting into the recycling. It's the small startups that are getting into these kind of products. And so they have to be able to play that investor game and that's a big, big key. It also has to be robust. A lot of times we design these systems and these recycling strategies on one stream. And that's not always your best bet. You gotta be able to take that system. That process has to be robust enough to take a variety of materials. Feedstock logistics. This is the one that scares me more than anything because I don't know much about logistics. <laughs> but like I said, is there enough material there? Is it available? How much is it per pound? Um, um, and how much is it gonna change over the next year or two? for the next five years. Do you have access to that inventory? Are you gonna be able to get that inventory? Where is it located? Do you have enough to sustain your process? Um, can you normalize somebody else's feedstock waste stream to, to fit your needs? And then where do you locate the processing facility based upon all those kind of things? And so these are really big questions that we all have when we start looking at, well, where do we put the next plant? Transportation logistics, is it all gonna be by truck? Can you do some rail? Can you do some barge? All those kind of things really need to be focused in on because it's not like we're making steel or aluminum or, or gypsum board or something like that where we know where that resource is. It's, it's almost kind of a guessing game where you think the industry is gonna go. And then it's another thing is be able to say, well, how much, how much waste stream do you have at your plant? No, I don't know uh, what is in it. I, I really don't know what's in it. And so you get these, you start to pull these layers off. You look at research opportunities. It's just tell me what your garbage is. Tell me how much of it is glass fiber, how much of it is foam. And, you know, understanding exactly what it is and where you can get it from is, is key. And then, like I said, this is, this is a no-brainer. You got to have quality. It's got to be consistent. Um, it's got to be competitive and it's got to be reliable um, out there in, in the marketplace. Um, distribution sales, you got to find your niche markets there. And, and like I said, you cannot, I mean, recycling is great. You can sit up there and that really pulls at the heartstrings of a lot of folks. But if you're making a recycled part that goes into the bottom part of a, the back end of a wheel hub of a car, recycling is not a real great selling point at that point in time. So you need to have it on performance and cost. If you're selling it as a cutting board that somebody buys at Ikea, yeah, you can maybe use a recycled note a little bit more, but you're not gonna get a huge amount of volume out of that, so. So one of the things that we've had to do at GFS is, is to build this whole supply chain. It's not like you can just go out there and say, all right, company X, bring me a bunch of this material and I'll process it. So we've had to go in and actually develop our our, our own supply chain. So if, I always like, I'm a, I'm a wood guy originally. I do a lot of stuff with the wood industry. And I always like to kind of associate it to that where you have forest operations, you got somebody that goes out there, loggers out there, cut it down. You got truckers that bring it to the mill. You got the one mill that, you know, makes lumber out of it. And then the, the scraps of residues go off to a paper mill or go to a particle board mill. All these different entities throughout this entire supply chain. We've had to do this pretty much the whole supply chain ourselves, just because it wasn't there. And so that's another thing that recycling industries have to consider is that where are you gonna get these materials and how you're gonna process them, all that, you're gonna have to take a lot of that ownership on to get that done. And so we're in the, the decommissioning, the service side. We go out, 
we don't climb up the, the turbines and drop the blades. That's a no-no. <laughs> they drop them down and they say, get them off of our property very quickly. Um, and so we come in, we get it, we break it down, we, we put it on trucks, we have trucks that we do it, transport it to our manufacturing operations or right now our, our storage yards, um, and then we process it. Uh, we're working hopefully with quite a few different distribution channels to do a lot of our sales with. So, Our manufacturing process real quickly is, is we break it down mechanically and we break it down the way we want it to, to get the sizes and the fractions that we want. So we break it down, we screen it, we have a, a product that goes into a composite structure like a particle board, fiber board structure, not like a unidirectional weave that a lot of you guys are used to in the aerospace industry, but more akin to what you see on your table or underneath your table is more likely a particle board panel. Um, so that's one product that we make, and then we also do a compounded pellet, so we use a reinforced thermoplastic pellet that we'll make out of this. Um, and so that's our two process platform there. But what we aren't doing is we're not trying to liberate that fiber. We're, we're keeping that integral strength of that original composite in our next generation composite. There's a lot of effort and a lot of time that went in to make that composite very, very strong. Let's keep it the way it is and utilize that strength. Um, so we're maintaining that. We're, we're, we're classifying or separating and screening out the, the size fractions that we want for our process. And then we, uh, we make our product out of that. So if you look at where we sit in the marketplace uh, compared to other similar products, if you look at uh, particle board MDF, this is strength and stiffness on the X and Y axis if you can't see it. OSB structural panels that you see for sheathing and all that, um, we're right in that, that realm of where they are for a structural performance there and, and stronger than, we look like a particle board MDF so we have that nice smooth surface that you can get out. I have samples in my bag if you guys wanna see it. Um, but we're, we're as strong as, as OSB in this regard. Um, but where we really shine on this is water. And this is where we, we feel is our, our strength in the market is the fact that we don't absorb, we're, we're fiberglass. <laughs> and you're competing against a lot of wood-based products. Well, wood absorbs a lot of water. I don't know if you guys know that or not. Um, and so if you look at parking board, fiber board, strand boards, you're well above 40% after a 24-hour water soak, we're down in that two, three percent range for the most part. So that's where we really feel as though we have um, a lot of attributes, a lot of strengths. And, and, and where, we, you know, where we look at in our market on this is we can't compete with particle board and fiber board. It's way too cheap, it's way too much volume out there, but we can compete where wood fails. And there's lots of applications where wood fails based upon moisture. Um, commercial flooring, siding products, any place that's, that's along a shoreline, <laughs> naval facilities. You know, there's so many different commercial and industrial applications that whenever we show it to people, they just love it. They say, hey, this would work in this obscure application within our, within our company. So uh, we're going after the water, um, water resistance of this or water performance of it. It's also really, really hard. Um, and so it makes a really nice surface. So it's really good for flooring. Um, but the other thing is, is more than likely somebody's going to put an overlay on top of this. And so having a smooth surface to accept an overlay is huge. Uh, so we have that going for us. Uh, like I said, we actually have a lot of, when you look at the wind industry, perception is everything right now. And I'm not going to get into anything that's been recently said, but uh, perception is a big thing. It's an alternative energy. The last thing GE, Siemens, Vestas, all the big players out there want to see is a bunch of their blades just going into the landfill because it's a horrible PR nightmare for them. So this idea of closed loop recycling where they could actually take some of our products that we're manufacturing and putting them back into the blade or back into the turbine itself is a really attractive thing for quite a few of the companies that are working with. So we're hoping we can do some closed loop work which would make things great for us there. So um, with the thermoplastic pellets, we're, we're looking at this also in the wood market or wood filled where you got your composite decking market. Uh, products like that where we can actually have the same, same lower water um, absorption behavior but also higher strength and higher stiffness properties in that. And so uh, we've looked at, um, we've made pallets out of it, piping, a variety of different plastics where we can use a filled system with a reinforcement in there. Um, and so 
We've actually, I, when I first designed this whole kind of process, I was looking at this pellet line as kind of being a secondary kind of operation. But now that we've kind of made some product and we've gotten it out to people, they love it. And so it's, it's actually going a lot better than I anticipated on it. You know, so. Um, so it comes back down to this whole idea is like why I'm talking here, I'm talking about wind turbines, you guys are all in aerospace, but like I said, we can't rely on just the wind energy. There's a lot of blades out there and a lot of, a lot of sources out there of, of wind turbines to get, but we also have a lot of abilities to take. Um, uh, we've done RVs, broken down RVs, broken down boats, done the same thing. But it all comes back to that logistics. How do you get all these materials that are spread out all over our nation and our world and get it into one location. And that to me is one of the biggest problems, but it's also can be you know, solved with knowledge. You know, we, we, we have this mentality of, you know, I was, I was watching the last presentation where this, you know, got this beautiful fuselage and, and also you got to cut out all these things. And I'm like, oh, where's all that garbage gonna go? We're, we're just so used to that, it's just garbage, just throw it away, just kind of. But there's a lot of value in that. And, and, and we have to change that mentality of, in our workplace, that these waste streams are not necessarily waste streams, they can be a feedstock for another industry. And getting that mentality into the, the plant floor makes our job a lot easier because all of a sudden, they're not just throwing everything into a dumpster, they're separating it out, they're not leaving the tapes on it, they're not, you know, they're doing things to clean it up. So there's a little more value to it. So those are the things, those are hurdles that we need to kind of um, look at. And then will all, these, will all these materials fit into our processing platform? Probably not. So we always have to be looking down, well, what are we gonna do next? Which comes into play of looking at, there we go. Other things that we're doing over here, I'm gonna highlight some of the WSU guys because I am a half-time WSU appointment. So <laughs> if you've seen some of the, the papers by Dr. DeSeries group, uh, we've worked with Boeing quite a bit on this one on making permeable pavements. I don't know if you guys know this, but Boeing owns a lot of concrete. And a lot of stormwater goes off of concrete and asphalt and it kills salmon, and that's a really bad thing to do in, in the Northwest. So uh, making permeable pavements where they actually, the water goes through it, it's a great idea. Problem is they're not very strong, they're not very durable, so we've been using some of the waste streams from Boeing and other industries and being able to reinforce <laughs> a permeable pavement system. So if you got any questions on that, Dr. Nasiri, is she still here? No, she, I think she had an earlier flight. Uh, but some of the students over there have done some of that work in there. Um, and then we did some work with Jakati actually quite a few years ago, or three years ago, with um, Triumph Composites, uh, where we actually took a, a thermoplastic carbon fiber composite and basically did similar techniques, pressed it back into a panel that was a Me Too product for them, and they just compressed it into another part just like they had before with a virgin-based product, and they were astounded by the, the look of it and the properties of it. So these things can be done. Um, this one is a, a good case of there's not a lot of peak out there. There's not a lot of thermoplastic carbon fibers out there. So hopefully as those move along, we'll have some really good, interesting pathways there for them to go. Uh, we're also looking at some of the chemical breakdown of CRP or uh, carbon fiber composites, where we can break them down. Um, take a lot of the resins off like we talked about, keep them nice and clean, um, and then being able to use them again. So we're, we're not completely out of the realm of doing that, but it, our focus right now is really on the, 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 the cured fiberglass composites and, and turning them into the products that we're looking at. So, questions? Thank you.